Okay, welcome back to our verse by verse Bible study through 1 Peter chapter 5. And uh, boy, I thought we'd get done with this in one or two times, but this is now our third in, uh, in our study of 1 Peter chapter 5. But hey, there's a lot there, so we need to get through it, okay? Last time I wrote this up here, I went ahead and left it up, and we'll see why here in a minute. So let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder, okay? Elder, again, would be pastor. And he says here, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, okay? So he's actually was an apostle because he had witnessed what Jesus went through, his death, burial, resurrection. And also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Well, we see that as a double application. For us, there's some glory revealed when Jesus comes at the rapture because he gives us a glorified body and, well, we get to marry the Lamb. Amen? It's the marriage supper of the Lamb when we marry Jesus, our, um, our husband. Our, uh, our husband, Ephesians 5, it is, talks about the church as, as the bride and Christ as the husband. Then verse 2, he goes into talking to pastors and how a pastor should be. He says, feed the flock of God which is among you. All right, the flock is the church. All right, so a man who is a pastor or a bishop or an elder or a missionary or evangelist or teacher, uh, someone who God is using to teach the Bible, preach to others, they need to do this. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. All right, so take the oversight, not by constraint, but willingly. This is how a preacher or a pastor should do what they do. Not for filthy lucre, of a ready mind, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being an example to the flock. So that's what we're going to look at today and then continue on is what does this mean? Well, taking the oversight, oversight I looked up in the 1828 dictionary is watchful care. So you care so much about people that you're doing your best to take care of them. Constraint is force or compulsion. You can't force people to do certain things. Um, lucre, filthy lucre. Lucre, we think of lucre as money, and it is. Gain and money or profit or goods. So don't use the ministry to get rich. Some, some people do, unfortunately. It shouldn't be that way. Then he says, of a ready mind. Okay, a ready mind. Where, where is that? And I think that's over in 1 Peter 3.15. Look at 1 Peter 3.15. Look what he says here, 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So you should know that Bible inside and out. And anytime someone asks you a question, you answer with Scripture. Now I get a lot of phone calls, uh, sometimes too many. <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, there's a couple of times where I just said, No, no, I, I need that time with my family now. I'm sorry, I can't answer. But most of the time, I always answer. My wife goes, you don't have to. I go, honey, it's the ministry. i got to help people, and I'll answer. And um, I do my best to try to be a good minister. And I get phone calls all the time from people saying, Brother Breaker, here's my situation. I'm going through this, or I'm going through that, or, or this is happening, or this guy did this to me, or this or that. Or, and, and what help? And I say, well, do you have your Bible there? Let's look at the Scriptures. And that's what I always want to do is try to point people to the Bible. And uh, that's what I try to do. I had a friend years ago that told me about an evangelist. And there was something that happened in one of the churches that the evangelist preached in. That the evangelist said, this is, this is wrong. And he saw it and he began to call different pastors. And he had a list, this evangelist, of, of pastors that he respected. Many of them were Ruckmanites from my old Bible school. And he went down the list and he called five, six different pastors. If I gave you the names, you might know them if you're a Ruckmanite. And he said none of them even wanted to talk to him. He said, brother, I'm going through this. I saw this happen in a church. It's hurting me. I really need to know what the right thing is to do because I want to help the church. The pastor did something evil. I need, I need help. He said he called six different pastors that he respected. He thought were the most spiritual, wonderful people that he knew said, not one of them said, I know the answer and I'll help you. They said, well, brother, I wish I could help you, but I don't know what to do. It's up to you. You pray about it. All right, bye. <laughs> then he called the seventh number, which is probably one of my favorite pastors in the whole world. Okay, I won't even say who his name is, but this guy, he's just amazing. I love him, man. Whew, he's a blessing. 
And uh, he told him that. He said, I just called six different pastors. Here's the seventh one. He said, none of them give me the time of the day. They won't give me any scripture. They won't help. He said, I don't know what to do. I'm in this situation. And this is my favorite pastor. He says, well, do you got your Bible right there? Get your Bible out. And this evangelist goes, you know what? That's sad. None of those other guys said, get your Bible. He said, you're the only one that told me to get the Bible. And he says, okay, what about this scripture? What? He went through the scriptures with them, and he helped them with the scripture. By the end of the phone call, this evangelist says, well, now I know what to do. And it's not based on my opinion and your opinion. It's right here in black and white. This is what I need to do, according to the Bible. So that's the way that we should be as ministers. Let me write that up there. Ministers. We should be ministers. A minister is someone who ministers to others. Ministers. <laughs> I wrote it wrong. Someone who ministers to others. Minister. To minister is help others. Do everything you can to help others. But we don't help them with our opinion. We help them with Scripture. So be of a ready mind. Now, also, neither as lords over God's heritage. So you don't lord over someone. You're not a dictator. You're not a tyrant. You're not a despot. Now, I hate to say it, but I've come across in my days, uh, from time to time, pastors that were just evil. I don't know what else to call them, but Baptist popes who run things and tell everybody what to do and put people down and attack them and it just they they're in the flesh and they're doing stuff in the flesh and that's that's sad that hurts me to see a man like that but I also see a lot of pastors that I've met that love the Lord and doing the best they can they always try to bring people to the book so there are good pastors there are bad pastors there are good Bible teachers there are bad Bible teachers there there are good ministers there are those who claim to be ministers but they aren't they don't minister <laughs> But what should we be? Well, we should be good ministers. And we should be an example to others. And that's what I want to be. I want to be an example. And I try to show you from time to time what the Bible teaches of what a true Christian is supposed to be. And there are many, many words in the Bible, and we've gone through it in this study. Kindness, meekness, compassion, hospitality, um, Love, brotherly kindness, all these things that we that are Christians are supposed to have and be. And I've done my best to be an example of that. I don't make videos attacking and putting down and lying about other people. I try to be a true minister and help others and edify, because that's what it's all about, edifying. Edify. Edify means to build up. Yet there's other people out there, all they want to do is tear down. And that's sad, that's sad. And I, I don't know what else to say except try to be an example of a true minister, one of these, that loves the Lord and does right. So much more I can say about that, but I'll stop. But being an example, being an example, 2 Thessalonians. And let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, okay, Peter is not the only one telling us to be an example. And by the way, the word is ensample. Ensample is the old English word for example. So an ensample or an example, same thing. But um, let's go to 2 Thessalonians 3.9. I'm going to show you some verses where Paul says about being an example. 2 Thessalonians 3.9. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. Now what is he saying? He's saying we're an example of what to be as a Christian. But it's interesting, the, the, the context, verse 6, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you would draw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. Now these traditions would be the teachings that, that, that they set up, that God gave them. Not false tradition. There's true tradition that's right, Bible tradition, and there's false tradition. This is the true tradition. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Okay? So, an example to another person is a person who is, who is not disorderly. So, we need to be orderly. Now, what's a disorderly person? Well, a disorderly person is someone whose heart is full of malice, spite, anger, hatred, meanness. Someone who lives only to tear down, not build up. 
to ridicule, to mock, to laugh at, to make fun of, to slander, to lie about, that's a disorderly person. And we're to withdraw ourselves from such. Verse 8, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Why, Paul even went out of his way to not get any money from people. If some people gave him an offering, oftentimes he'd turn around and gave it to another Christian. He didn't want anybody to think that he was just in it for the money. Well, I take money from people because people want to give. And the way I look at it is, if someone wants to give me something, they're laying up treasures in heaven because I'm doing what I'm doing for the Lord. So if I take their money, then I'm being a blessing to them because they're being a blessing to me because they'll be rewarded for what they give me. If I were to say, no, no, I don't want it, then I just rob them of a blessing in heaven because it's good to help people that are, that are serving the Lord. So I don't do this for the money. It's nice that I'm taking care of. Now, some people say, well, you have to be like Paul. You can't take money. Uh, let's go back to Paul's writings. I don't have time to turn over there, but remember what Paul said? If a man preaches the gospel, he, he is ordained to live of the gospel. So if you're a gospel minister, you have every right to be paid to preach the gospel, okay? And people don't pay me. I, I get offerings from people, and that's a blessing. And uh, so we can continue doing what we're doing. So there's nothing wrong with being paid as a pastor, if you're a pastor of a church and you're being paid. Nothing wrong with someone giving offerings and, and, and uh, things like that to others. What's wrong is doing it only for the money. Now there's the problem. That's called a novice. Someone who's preaching what the people want to hear. Knowing that if he preaches a certain way, it'll make people want to give more money. I don't do that. I don't allow money to, to decide what I teach or don't teach. I just teach what the Bible says. And I'm finding that many people appreciate that. You know, I'm not trying to teach what the denomination says or what some man says in his book or what this guy says. I'm just trying to go to the Bible and tell you this is what it says. <laughs> and uh, people appreciate that. And I think that's why they want to help us, and that's great. Um, so Paul tells us to be an example to him. Now look at verse 11 in 1 Timothy. Uh, where are we? First, uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians, excuse me. We're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And look at verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. All right? If somebody's not working, then they shouldn't eat. Now, some people will say, well, you don't work, Robert Breaker. You don't have a 9-to-5 job. Yeah, because I've surrendered to the ministry. And it is a job doing all this. Like, day after day after day, phone call after phone call after phone call. Every single day of my life is devoted to the ministry. I get emails. I get phone calls. By the way, I only check my email every Monday, usually. So that's why I'm usually a week behind. Um, but I'm working, and I work outside. My wife and I, we have a little side business. We do work, okay? There's different kinds of work. What's sad to me is people think, oh, if you're a minister, then you don't work. <laughs> no, you probably work harder than other people as a minister because you're spending time in prayer, sometimes fasting, sometimes visiting people, sometimes talking to people, sometimes writing to people, sometimes going out on the preach, preaching on the street corner, sometimes... Not to mention that the hours after hours after hours after hours spent studying the Bible and, and studying, trying to get sermons together every week. It's a lot of work. But look what it says here in verse 11. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Verse 14, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. And it's a shame to me there's people out there that are called busybodies. And a busybody is someone who has nothing better to do than to be busy in their own body going after you and talking about you and what you do all the time. And I have people like that on YouTube, and I don't even care. I don't even keep up with them anymore. <laughs> people still email me, say, well, this guy said this. I don't care. But I find it interesting that they have nothing better to do than to be busy worrying about what I do. And then they can't wait to make a video on YouTube and say, oh, did you see what Robert Breaker did? And then twist my words, try to make it say something I didn't, or try to... It's just sad. It's just really sad. What are they an example of? Are they an example of this, someone who cares? Are they an example of someone who doesn't care, 
who doesn't care to minister or edify, but only can't wait to destroy someone else. And I have people on YouTube like that, and it's sad. I recently discovered that a lot of their channels are nothing more than what I said. <laughs> and they're, I think I figured out what they're doing. They're trying to piggyback off my ministry. So I'm devoting my time to teaching the Bible, and preaching the Bible, studying, working hard, trying to give you what God says, trying to help you. And then they want to take my name and then talk about me. Well, people are looking me up, then they see my name, and they go, oh, what's he have to say? And all they're trying to do is to, to make me look bad so they can get people to follow them. Kind of sounds like Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Look at what Paul says. Acts chapter 20 in verse... Uh, so, so what they're trying to do is piggyback off of my ministry. Ruckman used to call it that way. Ruckman used to say, there's people out there, they just want to say Ruckman. And they just want to use my name, Ruckman, and piggyback off my ministry. And then get people to follow them, because people like Ruckman, well, they hear you're saying Ruckman, so maybe we'll listen to you. And they're trying to get people to follow them, and yet they used his name to get them to follow them. Well, I don't do that. You know, I started my ministry, I usually never even say the name Ruckman, and when I started on YouTube, I didn't mention Ruckman. I, I don't mention Ruckman a lot. Because some people don't like Ruckman. You know, I don't want this to be about Ruckman. This is about the Bible. Amen? But uh, there are people out there, they, they want a YouTube channel that's big. They want a following. They want people to listen to them. So what they do is they use your name and then try to get traffic to come to them because they're using your name. And I see people do that. But what is their goal? Why are they doing that? Because they want to get people over with them. So they'll attack and ridicule and mock and laugh at and put down and call you know me a liar and things like that in order to try to get people to come over to their side so that their basis of fellowship is making fun of Robert Breaker. And I find that so just pointless and stupid. Who cares about me? What about this? What about the book? So look at Acts 20:29. 20, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Paul says, you know what? I know it and I hate it, but there's going to be some wolves that come in after I'm gone. And what do they do? Verse 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. There are people out there that want their own disciples. So they'll run over to my channel, try to hear what I have to say, and then try to say, Oh, he's so wrong. If you'll follow me, then I'll tell the truth. And you can, you'll can you know what the truth is if you'll follow me because, oh, he's wrong. And I just find that so sad. Why do you have to make it about you and me? Why don't you make it about the Bible? Why don't you do what I do? I try to be an example. And I try to just give you a book. Give you the book. Give you what the Bible says. Tell you what this book says and teach what the Bible says. And I want you to fall in love with the Bible, not with me. <laughs> See, I'm not interested in, in my opinion. I'm interested, interested in what does the Bible say. And that's what I try to do. Now look at um, verse 31. Therefore watch, and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silk silver or gold or apparel. And he goes on and on and on. Paul was a man who truly cared about people and wanted to see them built up in the faith. And what we're seeing today, sadly, is people out there that claim to be ministers, claim to be preachers or teachers or Bible believers or whatever, and they are not following the Bible. They are not this. And they are not an example of what the Bible says to be. Rather, they're an example of disorderliness and busybodies and doing things the opposite of what the Bible says. Well, I want to be a good example, not a bad example. So I'm doing my best. I know I'm not perfect. I never claim to be. Amen? But I do what I can. And I try my best to be a good example of a true Christian. And that's why I don't fight with these people or, you know, attack them back when they attack me or say, I just say, oh, Lord, you take care of them. And that's the best we can do. Now, being an example, go to Philippians 3.17. Philippians 3.17 says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us, for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies 
of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and their, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So there are some people out there that don't want to be a good example. Well, I want to be even more a good example. And sometimes we're told to mark those which are a bad example. Well, I think you know who they are, okay? I don't need to talk about them. <laughs> I get emails from time to time, Brother Breaker, this guy. And they mention his name. I go, yeah, yeah, that's, that was one of them. Oh, yeah, well, what about this guy, Brother Breaker? What? I go, yeah, what about him? And here's what they're telling me. I watch this person, and they have all these videos against you. And I watch some of their videos. I go, well, I said, well, I'm sorry. You wasted your time, didn't you? And as they said, yeah. They said, I watched the video, and I don't see what they're saying. They're trying so hard. They're calling you names. They're getting angry. They're yelling. They're screaming. They're saying you're this horrible, awful thing. And you're wrong, and this, and this, and this. And they're like, I can't even understand the person. And their arguments don't make sense. And I don't, I don't even know what they're trying to say. I said, well, yeah, so they're, <laughs> I said, okay, okay. And, and then they tell me this. They say, Brother Breaker, it's so pointless. I go to you and I get fed from the Word of God. If I go to them, I don't get fed. All I get is sick. That someone would act that way and talk that way about another brother in Christ. So I'm just telling you what I hear from other people. And that makes me even more to want to be an example of good, not of evil. I want to be an example of good. I don't want to be this. I don't want to be disorderly. I don't want to be a busybody. Okay? So I'm going to do even more and more that I can to be the true example of a Christian. And the best thing you can do as a Christian is to be an example of goodness and righteousness and justice and peace and gentleness and kindness and not like they are. All right, 1 Timothy 4.2 says... Or, excuse me, 412. But let no man despise thy youth. Be thou an example of the believers. All right, so we're to be an example. In what? In word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Okay? So charity is the key. Uh, charity is what I want to have. And in my conversation, I don't want to be a name caller or put people down. I don't want to do bad things. I want to be a good example of a true Christian. First Peter uh, 2.21. Sadly, there's some people out there that don't want that. And, and I've seen um, some people go the wrong path lately. And I got some emails lately. Brother Breaker, um, so-and-so's on YouTube and they're attacking you now. They used to be a follower of yours. And I go, yeah, yeah. And you should see them. They're, they're just, they're angry, they're mean, they're cussing, they're lying, they're, they're saying things that aren't true. And, and the more their videos come out, the more awful they are. What is that? Well, they're in the flesh. And they chose to follow someone in the flesh who's not a good example. And if they continue, they're going to keep going downhill. I care about them, right? Oversight, watchful care. You know, what is oversight? It's watchful care. Uh, I keep an eye on them and I pray for them. I do care for them. And the best thing I could do, the best advice I can give you is get away from men and get in the Bible. Read this book. You know who you are. You told me, I, I'm not good at reading the book, Robert. I can't read the book. I can't read the Bible. You can read. You just don't want to. Get in that book day after day after day and read what it says instead of listening to what that guy says. And your life will be way better. Okay? That's all I have to say about that. Now, 2 Peter 2.21 for even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that she should follow his steps. So Jesus Christ is our example. Paul is our example. Now, as a matter of fact, let's go to Jesus in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. And in Mark chapter 10, look what Jesus says. Mark chapter 10, we read verse 42. And uh, let's see if this is the right thing here, okay? Before I read Mark chapter 10, let me go back. Let me go back to uh, 1 Peter 5. Then we'll go to Mark 10, because I wanted you to get this, okay? 1 Peter chapter 5. Feed the flock of God, which is among you taking the oversight, which is watchful care. Not by constraint, okay? Don't force people, but willingly. I willingly want to serve God. And to do that, I realize I need to be a minister, and I, I'm here to serve you. You know, a lot of times it'd be easy to go, the heck with you, man, I want to go do my thing. But then I wouldn't be a minister, would I? 
See, being a minister is saying, okay, others come before myself. And that's hard. That's, that's humbling. But it says, uh, willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Okay? So I'm not to be a bad example. I'm to be a good example. A bad example of a minister or a pastor or a preacher is someone who wants to lord over you. What does it mean to lord over someone? It means to be a dictator. Or it means to be a bully. Someone who's a bully is someone who thinks they're better than you and up above you and higher than you, and so they attack you and put you down. A lord over someone's heritage, someone who's a snooty, is that the word, a snob? Someone thinks, I'm better than you, so I'm not going to do anything for you. But a dictator. Now look at what Jesus says about not being a dictator or being a lord over someone else. Uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 42. But Jesus called them to him, and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise, lord, exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so it shall not be among you, but whosoever will be greatest among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. So we're told by Peter that we should never, ever try to lord over somebody else in the sense that in a religious thing, all right? So as a pastor of a church, the last thing I should ever do is look at that and go, well, that means I'm the big daddy. That means I'm in charge. That means what I say goes and everybody has to obey me and it's all about me. If I ever get that idea or that mentality and I ever act like that, it'd be very easy for me to abuse other people. So here we are in the church age, and here I'm supposed to be a preacher. But I'm not to abuse that. What's sad to me is the abuse that is all over in the name of religion. The Romanist church. It's come out. So many priests have abused altar boys that it's just it's just horrible there's just pedophilia everywhere and it's come out in the news I've seen in independent Baptist churches the abuse there's been some churches where they abuse kids pastors abuse children I can tell you story after story after story of, that I know of pastors that are in jail now because they uh, um, abused a child in the sense of sexual abuse I've heard of pastors abusing and, and browbeating their congregations uh, I've heard, you know, I don't even want to get into the stories, but when you're a pastor, you're a position of authority, and, and but it's a spiritual authority because you're trying to protect the doctrine and teach the truth. But a lot of pastors get in the flesh, and that's the problem. If you're in the flesh, then you're going to do things in the flesh. But God says, walk in the spirit, that we fulfill not the lust of the flesh. So I don't want to be in the flesh, because in the flesh, I could become a dictator. But if I'm in the Spirit, I will do my best to be a minister. Because it would be very easy in the flesh to say, look, I'm in charge here. I know more Bible than you. You do what I tell you now. You write a check out for $5,000 and you send it to Robert Breaker right now because I'm in charge. And God will kill you if you don't do what I say. <laughs> I can say that. I'm not. I don't want to. God forbid someone takes that out of context and puts it on YouTube or whatever. But... I could do that. That would be an evil person. That would be a dictator. That is someone who's not a good example of a true minister. That is someone who's in the flesh and only cares about themselves. And then, what is that? That is fear. That is making you fear me and then saying, you do what I say or else. That is being a lord over God's heritage. Jesus says, you don't do that. You don't do that. Look what Jesus says. He says, Whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever you be the chiefest shall be servant for all. So what am I supposed to do? God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. All right? If you truly love somebody, you'll do what's best for them and try to help. If you don't, you'll try to hinder them. I see people out there that claim to be Christians. They get on their little YouTube and all they do is talk bad about other Christians and their ministries. And I've never understood that. 
I don't understand what would make a man who claims to be a King James Bible believing Christian want to hinder the work of God and hinder other Christians. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But if you surrender to the will of God and you're doing your best to try to help other Christians and be a good minister of Christ, why on earth would somebody attack you and claim to be a Christian? I don't understand. I don't understand. I just don't get it. Jesus said not to be that way. Peter said, don't be like that. Paul tells us over and over, there's an example that we're supposed to be. And we're supposed to be good. So back to 1 Peter chapter 5. Neither be lords, verse 3, neither be as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. So we're to be an example, an example, an example of righteousness, justice, truth, peace, love, uh, kindness, and things like that. Now verse 4, When the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Alright, so now he's talking about the chief shepherd. Now we just looked at feed the flock. So in the church age, the church is like the flock. And the flock is the sheep. And so the pastor, a pastor is someone that is in charge of a flock. The pastor is to care. So the pastor cares for the sheep. So that means the pastor is what? He's a shepherd. Now one of my favorite pastors is up in Kansas. And he has sheep. And I was supposed to go up there, spend some time with him. But the COVID thing kept us from it. And I was looking forward to recording him because he has sheep. And he, the first time we went up there, he told us everything you want to know about sheep and how sheep, taking care of sheep, and then being a pastor, and all the correlations and how Jesus talks about sheep and, and sheep. And, and oh, I was hoping to record him giving a sermon about sheep and what it's like to physically keep sheep, the animals, and how that's just like being a pastor of a church and dealing with the people in your church. I was really looking forward to that. Maybe someday we'll get a chance to do that. But what is a pastor supposed to be? A shepherd. And a shepherd is supposed to care for the sheep and know them by name and, and take care of them. Well, Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd. So what does that mean? That means that he cares for us. I spelled chief wrong, didn't I? <laughs> Right, he's the chief shepherd. All right, a pastor is to care for the sheep. Jesus cares for us. Look right there, in chapter five, in verse seven, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Who is this? Jesus. Jesus really cares about you. He cared enough about you to die for you on the cross. So, if He is our true example, and He is, then we ought to care enough about others to die for them. Do you have that much love for another brother or sister in Christ? They're lying about you, attacking you, ridiculing you, making fun of you, saying things about you that aren't true. Do you love them enough that, if need be, you die for them? <laughs> well, that's pretty rough, isn't it? <laughs> There's people on YouTube that claim to be King James Bible believers, and I look at them and go, man, I, I love them, but I just I wish they'd do right. But I don't think I love them enough to die for them. I hate to say, hey, at least I'm honest, amen. <laughs> but they don't love me enough to die for me. In fact, in the flesh, they hate me enough that they want to attack me. I don't want to attack them. But that's what they want to do. They want to attack me. Okay, well, where's the love? I don't want to attack. I want to edify. I want to help them. But in this world in which we live, a lot of people claim to be Christians. They don't live right. They don't do right. They're not reading their Bibles. They're not the kind of person that God said they're supposed to be. And sadly, there's a lot of people that claim to be preachers or Bible teachers, and they're not what they're supposed to be. So I try to teach you the Bible to show you there's some things the Bible says that we're supposed to be like. Don't be like those that are doing the opposite. Be like those that are doing right. Because they're literally they're an enemy of God instead of a friend. 
Maybe that's why they won't be friends with me. I, I want to be friends with these people. I've reached out to over the years, some of these people that attacked me on YouTube. I said, look, I don't know what your beef is against me, but I forgive you, and I care about you. I love you in the Lord, and I'd love to be your friend. You seem like you'd be a great person to, to be friends with because you believe the Bible, and I believe the Bible. No. No, you'd think they'd write back, oh, Brother Breaker, all right, let's let bygones be bygones. All right, let's forget about it. Let's get along. Okay, let's be friends. No. You pious, pompous jackass, you moron, you fool. You know, that's the way they talk. Well, you're you're just full of pride. You think you're so great. It's like, okay, bye-bye. <laughs> I'm not going to be like you. So I don't want to talk about them. I don't want to remember them, but they are a great illustration of an example of what not to be. Because this is the example of what we should be if we're pastors and preachers and teachers and ministers. So now he goes into verse 4 about a crown, a crown of glory. So let me write up here the five crowns that we can have in the Bible. The five crowns. See, there are some rewards that we can get in the Bible if we serve Jesus. And they're crowns. So let's put up here the five crowns in the Bible. And my question is, will you have any? There's the crown of glory. That's the one here in 1 Peter 5.4. There's the crown of life. That's found in James 1.12. And I won't read these for sake of time. I'll let you, you know, pause it and look these up if you so desire. The uh, best thing to do is write them in the notes in your Bible, you know, and uh, you'll have it there for later. But there's a crown of rejoicing. That's First Thessalonians. Oh, let me put this. Two nineteen. There's the crown of righteousness. And that's Second Timothy four eight. And then there's the incorruptible crown. And that is found in 1 Corinthians 9.25. Now, I like to do seven, you know, but I've never found what the seventh crown is. But there is a, a um, crown that the Bible talks about that's a physical crown. So the, the Romans would put a laurel crown. So let's just put a, an earthly crown. There's an earthly crown. And I forget the verse, but it talks about, you know, he that runneth a race. Well, you, you run a race in ancient Rome and you won, you put a crown of laurels on your head. So it was just kind of like a prize. And so they're set. But I know God always does seven, so I was wondering, what's the seventh crown? <laughs> I don't know. But here on earth, this is something you could win on earth. And you know, I ran track in high school, and my legs are just too short. And uh, I didn't win very much, but at least I didn't lose. I mean, I was, <laughs> it got to the point where in track in high school, it's like, as long as I'm not in last place, I'm happy. And uh, then I moved to the tennis and I played tennis but here's the five crowns now if you're a Christian and you're living for Jesus and you're walking in the spirit the things that you do for God God gives you a reward for at the judgment seat of Christ so the judgment seat of Christ is going to be up here after the rapture and that's when God gives us our rewards for what we've done for him and there are five crowns that you can get in heaven for your service for Jesus. Now, I'm not going to read them and go through them and, and look up all the verses. I've written them up here. But there's a crown of glory, a crown of life, a crown of rejoicing, a crown of righteousness, and an incorruptible crown. And if you are what you're supposed to be as a Christian, living for Jesus and doing what he says, following the example that we're given in the Bible of Peter and Paul and Jesus and early apostles, you can get these crowns. But if you're one of these people that is abusing others, I don't want to abuse, abuse other people. I want to, what's the opposite of abuse? Um, just care for others, you know, not abuse them. But if you're abusive and evil and angry and mean-spirited and hateful, and you're the opposite of the example of what you're supposed to be as a Christian, you're not going to get these crowns. And it sounds like these rewards are an eternal reward that we have for all eternity. And they'll always mark back to what you did and what you lived like as a Christian. 
She, can you imagine getting to heaven at the judgment seat of Christ and you were just a poor excuse for a Christian and you were mean and hateful and angry, didn't do much for Jesus, all you did was attack people? And God goes, well, sorry, no crown for you. <laughs> and all eternity, you're walking around with other Christians that have two crowns or four crowns or one crown and you got no crowns. And for all eternity, people look at you that were Christians and go, well, you didn't do anything for Jesus, did you? <laughs> Um, not much. You know, can you imagine? That's why it's so important to do something for Jesus because all eternity will show how much you loved him while you were here on this earth. That's kind of sad. So verse 4 says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear. Now, again, double application. When does he appear? He appears at the rapture for the church. He appears at Armageddon for the Jews. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Now, here we go. Younger and elder. Let's go to 1 Timothy 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. And in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, we read these words. 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2 says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, and younger as sisters with all purity. So the elder and the younger. All right, so go back to uh, hear what he's saying here. Likewise, 1 Peter 5, 5, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. So this means the younger Christians to learn from older Christians. So if you just got saved and you don't know much Bible, and I've been saved for, I was thinking about the other day, something like 28 years now, 27, 28. Well, you don't come along and say, you're an idiot, Robert Breaker. You don't know nothing. Let me show you what the Bible says. It's like, and how long have you been saved? Two years? Yeah, you're going to tell me, aren't you? <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't make much sense. In the Bible, it's called an elder, the pastor, and he's elder because he's older. And the older should have grown more and should know more so that an older Christian should be able to teach a younger Christian. That's the way it should work. Now, it doesn't always work that way. There are people that can get saved and never grow. But what does uh, Peter say in 2 Peter, the very last verse? 2 Peter, look at what Peter says. But grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So what we're supposed to do as Christians is grow. And your spiritual growth is determined by how much you learn how to love and care and help and edify and, and make friends and minister to others and, and, and be charitable. It's all about charity. Amen? And caring. And do you, do you do what the Bible says? You grow by reading the Bible. It's one thing to read, but now you need to put in practice what you read. And there are people out there, and they're older men probably, there's probably some people older than me on YouTube that are attacking Robert Breaker, and they're trying to portray themselves as, I'm older than him, and I know the Bible better than he does, and he's an idiot. Robert Breaker doesn't know anything. I'm, look at me. I'm an elder. That man may have be older and read more Bible than I have, although I've read the Bible through many times, but he's not putting into practice what he's read. So he might be older physically, but has he grown? He's not even past the basic things that the Bible says you're supposed to mature as a Christian. You're supposed to be mature. That's the word, mature. Maturity. The more you suffer as a Christian, the more mature you become. And that's what we need to do, is to become mature. All right? Let's continue reading verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. So we're supposed to be humble. We're supposed to have humility. What is humility? Well, humbleness is not getting angry and attacking and putting others down and, and thinking, I know everything, so I'm going to have to put this person in their place or whatever. That's not charity. Humility is, all right, I'll hear what you have to say. Go ahead, tell me. Tell me where I'm wrong. Tell me what's wrong. Tell me why you don't like me. Now, if that person can do that in a mature manner, then I would love to hear what they have to say. <laughs> but almost every one of these people on YouTube that attack me, 
and I don't take my time to watch their videos because I don't have time, but I try. I want to know where they're coming from and what they have to say against me. Every time I've tried, I see a lack of this. I see no maturity. I see people making YouTube videos in which they go, all right, I'm going to tell you about Robert Breaker, this moron, this full ass jackass, this pug-nosed, cross-eyed moron, fool, doesn't know what he's talking about, what a liar, what a freaking moron, and, just, and you're just looking at it going, all you're doing is calling me names, and you want me to take you seriously as a mature, mature elder in Christ? <laughs> yeah, right. You're not an elder. You're acting like a kindergarten. How am I supposed to take you seriously? I graduated from kindergarten a long time ago. I wish you would. As we get into 2 Peter, we're going to find how 2 Peter has a whole lot of doctrine. There's only three chapters in 2 Peter, and it's chock full of doctrine. 1 Peter is five chapters, and it's just milk. But it all goes to suffering. You know what the first thing Jesus Christ said in the New Testament was? Suffer. In the King James Bible. If you have a different version, he didn't say that. But the first word in the King James Bible of Jesus Christ in the New Testament is suffer. Let me go show you that. I think it's Matthew 3.15. Let me see if I got that right. Part of learning to be a Christian is to bite your lip and to bite your tongue and to have charity and to suffer. If there's someone out there you don't like, you don't talk about them. Somebody says something you don't want to hear, you keep your mouth shut. And pray for that person and say, God, I don't think that guy's good. I don't think he's right. I don't like what he's saying. Lord, help me to keep my mouth shut and not speak against him. But Lord, please help me. Give me wisdom to know if I should say something. Matthew 3.15, And Jesus answered unto him, Suffer it to be so now. First word out of Jesus' mouth in the entire New Testament is suffer. You know, do you suffer? The more you suffer, the closer you get to Jesus and his suffering on the cross. Jesus could have not gone to the cross. Jesus could have said, you know what? Everyone's a sinner, and they all deserve hell, so I'm just going to put them there. And we could all be burning in hell right now. But he said, no, I'm going to be a better man, and I'm going to suffer myself for the evil that they did, and I'm going to put up with it. Matter of fact, I'm going to die for it so that I can forgive it. Wow. Tell you what, that's a man. A real man is not somebody that can cuss and use words that others don't. A real man is someone who can suffer and who can forgive and who can bite his tongue and keep from saying mean, hateful, spirited things about others. That's a real man. If you claim to be a man and you don't do those things, then you're not humble and you're no, not mature at all. That's what Paul was speaking about when he was talking to those in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 he says, And I, brethren, cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes. He says, You're all a bunch of babies in Christ. You have not matured. I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? See, that was the Pharisees. The Pharisees were carnal. Up shows Jesus Christ. God manifest in the, in the flesh. Never sinned one time. Pure righteousness and justice and peace and love and mercy and grace. He shows up and they're just sitting there gnashing their teeth saying, I hate that guy. I can't wait to kill him. Who does he think he is? He thinks he's so much better than us. You know, they're doing that there with their teeth just going, oh, I hate him. They weren't very mature, were they? They had no grace, did they? No long-suffering, did they? They weren't a good example. They were a horrible example. Likewise, ye younger, verse 5, submit yourselves to the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. All right, this is a quote from Proverbs 3, 34. So let's go to Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 34. And let's look at the context of Proverbs and see if there's anything else there. Proverbs 3, 34. Again, he goes back to the Old Testament. Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace to the lowly. Okay, so it sounds like the same thing, a lot of people say. So what, uh, what exactly is 
chapter 3. Well, let's just read all of Proverbs chapter 3, and that will give me a good excuse to do one more here on chapter 5 later. So Proverbs chapter 3, what does it say? My son, forget not the law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Oh, keep your heart. Make sure your heart is right with God, because if you're in the flesh and you're one of these, your heart's not right with God. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Oh, okay. So there's a connection there of having your heart right with God means you might live a longer life and more have peace. Verse 3, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them upon thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Mercy and truth. Mercy. Have you ever had mercy with anybody? So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. Amen. It shall be health to thy navel, and marrow to thy bones. So health, having good health, is connected to how your heart is, and how much mercy you have. Interesting. Verse 9, Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father of the son in whom he delighteth. Well, that's Paul quoting that in, in Hebrews chapter 12 as well. Verse 13, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. So wisdom and understanding, do you have any? Only mature people have wisdom and understanding. Elders have experience. Amen? For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies. What is she? Wisdom. And all the things thou canst desire are not to be a compared unto her. Wisdom. Length of days is in her right hand and in her, her left hand riches and honor. In her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. Wow. So a wise person is a person who knows the Bible and says, you know what, I'm going to be the kind of person like the Bible says, a mature Christian. I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to attack. I'm not going to be mean and hateful and angry and, and call others names. I'm going to be full of charity and meekness and kindness and hospitality and love. Because you know what, that will bring peace and happiness and pleasantness. How pleasant is it for brothers to dwell together in unity, the Bible says. <laughs> Amen. Verse 18, now when it says she, it's always going back to wisdom. She is a tree of life to them that hold upon her, and happy is every one that retaineth her. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth, by understanding he hath established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths are broken up, and the dews, the clouds drop down the dew. My son, let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. Discretion. Discretion is not just lashing out and saying stupid things. It's, you know... You know, maybe I won't say something. Maybe I'll just sit back and wait. <laughs> yeah, that's discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in thy way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the power of thine hand, to do it. Say not unto thy neighbor, Go, and come again, and tomorrow I will give thee when thou hast it by thee. Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing thou dwellest securely by thee. Ooh, so don't be evil to your neighbor. Strive not with a man without cause, if he have done thee no harm. Envy thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways. Don't be a what dictator. Don't oppress or abuse people. Envy thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways. For the froward is abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesseth the habitation of the just. Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace to the lowly. Wow, so if you're going around scorning people, a scorner is someone who just ridicules and mocks people. God's in heaven going, you just wait. You're going to get it. Because that's not how we're supposed to act. We're not supposed to be a bunch of scorners. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. So that's an interesting thing. So it's all about being humble. Go back to uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and uh, verse 6. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. So I need to care for Jesus and not care about what others say about me. And when others attack me and put me down say bad things, I just say, Lord, I cast all my care upon you. You see it. 
you take care of it, Lord. Help me just to be what I'm supposed to be, not sink to their level, you know, and just be mature. Help me to be a mature Christian, Lord. Now, God resisted the proud and gives the grace to the humble. Let's look over here at James now. James 4.10, because that's a, kind of a cross-reference here. James chapter 4 and verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Oh, yeah, that sounds like what Peter's saying. Be humble. But then look at the context in verse 11. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. So the context of humility is a humble person is someone who doesn't put other people down and call them names and attack and lie about them. Humility is someone who's humble and doesn't speak bad about other people. That's the context. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou art, if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. So humble yourself and don't speak evil about others. All right, so back 5.5. Five. 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Ye all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Who cares for you? God. <clears throat> because God cares for us, and he suffered for us on the cross, we should also care for others and be willing to suffer for them. Because we care about them, because we love them, because we want to see them do right. Now there's a lot more that I could get into. I guess I'll stop there. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot more. So we'll, we'll try to finish this up next time. And uh, hopefully we will. I don't know how much more I have, but enough that I think we can try to finish up next time. I hope this has been a blessing. God bless.